All right, so we, we begin with the fungi chapter. And um, one thing I want to say, uh, important things to do to prepare for any of the tests, obviously for this test, it would be read the assigned chapter out of the open snacks. And then those videos that are posted are also you know, going to be important information to have. And so I'm, I, my goal with these study guides is to pick out the things that are most important so, so that hopefully if you've read the chapter, listened to the videos, that you can go through this study guide for the most part and, and fill it out or maybe reflect back a little bit on some things. So I'm going to use the study guide to guide us through and I'll fill in the study guide as we go, but we'll go back and forth looking at some figures too. At any time, type in the chat box or raise your hand if you have a question or comment. So, so first of all, um, let me get my pen here. When we're talking about organisms, so how do we differentiate fungi from other, you know, living things? Okay, so fungi are not plants because they do not have chloroplasts. They, they are not able to perform photosynthesis. So that separates them from plants, certainly. What, what is unique about the fungi is, first of all, they're saprophytic, and what that means is their food source is dead or decaying matter. What's even more interesting about them is they perform external digestion, so they create these digestive enzymes like what we would produce inside our digestive tract, but they secrete them outside of their cell mass. The food gets um, broken down, and then they absorb the broken down or already digested nutrients back in. So that's, a, that's something interesting about fungi. Um, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Okay, an important thing to know is their cell wall is made of chitin. We talked about chitin a little bit um, in 1408, if you had 1408, when we were talking about macromolecules, so chitin is a polysaccharide. And so plants do have cell walls, right? But plant cell walls are made out of cellulose. So this is a, a different chemical composition of their cell wall. Now, um, fungi come in unicellular varieties and in multicellular varieties. The, the multicellular are the ones we're most familiar with because these are the ones we see, like a mushroom or bread mold. Um, but the unicellular ones are just generally called yeasts. And so if you're a baker or if you brew your own beer or something, then you may have used yeast because that's what aids in that process. Okay, so they exist in what we call a vegetative state and a reproductive state. So the veg vegetative is essentially non-reproductive, right? They're just being a fungus. And what a fungus body is made up of are these structures called hyphae, okay? And essentially they're these long thread-like structures. And when you look at all the hyphae, collectively, it's called mycelium or a mycelium mat. And so, for example, when you think of if you go out and after all the rain we've had, maybe you see a mushroom somewhere. So under the ground, there is going to be a, a mass of these hyphae or a mycelium mat that, that's not visible to the eye. Now, the reproductive structure of, of a fungus um, depending on, remember, they, they can either be asexual, meaning that just one fungus, right, produces spores, or they can re reproduce sexually where you have two different parents. <clears throat> asexual reproduction can, can either be budding, fragmentation, or they can form spores. And we, you, you saw a lot of these types in your fungus lab, okay? Um, they usually reproduce sexually when the conditions are bad, okay, adverse conditions. And there's two mating types, okay. Um, it can either be, okay, I'm going to try to write this where you can read it, homothallic, where both mating types are produced in one mycelium mass, or it can be heterothallic, where you have two separate mycelium bodies. Okay, 
And I just want to welcome those of you who just joined in. Um, if you have any questions, just use the chat box and I will make sure that I get those answered throughout the night. So we're starting with fungi. We're going to work all the way up through this week's lecture on plants. Okay, so, and also, these study guides, there's one, there should be one for each lesson, and it should be in the lesson lecture folder at the top. Okay, all right, so first page down. Um, there are five phyla that I want you to be familiar with, some general things about each five of these um, that make up this fungi kingdom. So, Ascomycota we'll talk about first. So what are the major things to, to recall or to know about this? Well, they're cup fungi or sac fungi, okay? And, and I'll show you a picture. They, they look like that. But what are some key things? Well, um, number two. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped that. Yep, sorry. Number two. Okay, it, it is karyogamy. Sorry. Skipped right down. Okay. Um, there we go. So the the ascomycota also produce antibiotics like penicillin. So penicillin, the first antibiotic, was discovered in 1928. And up until that point, there were a lot of diseases that were just deadly until the discovery of penicillin. So this this is produced by one of these Ascomycota fungi. Um, when they undergo asexual reproduction, they make something called conidia. That's the kind of spores that they make asexually. Now, when they reproduce sexually, this should be somewhat familiar to you because you viewed these in your fungus lab. So they form spores in, in groups of eight, okay, in these little sacs called ASCII. And, um, you, you viewed those, so they're called ascospores. So you know how Latin names are. Ascus is the singular. Asci would be the plural. Um, OK, the uh, one other thing that I actually don't have on this thing that, that I want to make sure that I, I don't forget to tell you is there is um, a species of yeast that fall into this group. Okay, and I'm just going to abbreviate it S. It's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, and these, if you do bake or if you make your own beer or something, these are the ones that are used. So these, you might call it brewer's yeast or baker's yeast. So this, this belongs to this Ascomycota group. Okay, moving along to the basidiomycota. So this is probably, at least for me, when I think about a fungus, this is what comes to mind, the mushroom-type fungus. Um, and, and the actual mushroom that you see with the caps and the gills is called the fruiting body. And the fruiting body is where the spores will be produced and it will be released. But under that fruiting body, underground, there's actually a, a large network of the mycelium that spread out, that, that reach out to collect, you know, water and nutrients from the soil. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a fairy ring before of mushrooms. And, and what that means is many times when mushrooms pop up, they pop up kind of in a circular pattern. Sometimes it's called a fairy ring. And the reason that that happens is underground, the body of the fungus, the hyphae, are actually growing outward in a circle. And so the fruiting bodies sort of pop up in that circular pattern. Now let's just, uh, just a minute. And I want to make sure we look at some images. So this first image that I'm showing you, this is the first group, the Ascomycota, what's called the sac or the cup fungus. So it really looks like a little cup, okay, that's growing there. Now let's look at the Basidiomycota. Okay, so this would be what you would call a mushroom, right? That, that's the fruiting body that you're seeing above ground. 
And that brings us to Chytridial mycota. Now, what's important about these, first of all, these have swimming spores. So in other words, they have flagella so that they swim, which means these normally live in water, right? They require water for swimming. Another important thing about these, these are causing a lot of problems for amphibians. They're parasitic to amphibians. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the parasitic types of fungi. Most of these are going to be unicellular. Now, the, I'll show you a couple pictures in a minute, but the next group, let's go ahead and talk about the next group, glomerulomycota. What I really want you to think about in this group is one main thing, and that is this, this called mycorrhiza. And essentially what this mycorrhiza means is it is a symbiotic relationship that fungi have with plants. And it turns out that they have done a lot of research and they found out that about 80 to 90 percent of plants have this relationship in their roots, some kind of symbiotic relationship. And what happens is, so a plant can photosynthesize, therefore it turns sunlight into chemical energy, so it can essentially provide chemical energy or sugar, right, for the fungus, whereas the fungus can extend the hyphae out and collect water and minerals out of the soil, soil and supply that for the plant. So when you think about glomerulomycota, I want you to think about mycorrhiza. Now, just as a disclaimer, those are not the only group of fungi that can form mycorrhiza, but those are the only ones that I'm going to ask you about, right? In biology, we have exceptions all the time. So um, for the most part, I want you to make that association. Now let's just look really quickly before I change pages. So here's a, a frog that has been infected by a chytrid, so the, of the group Chytridial mycota. So those uh, example of the parasitic type. Okay, the fifth group that we're going to talk about today, the zygomycota, this is also one that you looked at in your fungi lab. Um, you looked at the rhizopus, which is um, common bread mold, right? And, and you kind of saw microscopically the spores at the tips of the, the bread mold that were produced there. Now let's talk about fungi as far as ecosystems go. Well, these are very important decomposers. Um, without our decomposers, right, there's not a way to recycle this organic matter back through the ecosystem. So the dead and decaying matter that they externally digest, um, they're helping to make those nutrients available throughout their ecosystem. Now, um, we already mentioned the mycorrhizal relationship. Whoops, that's a Z. So myco means fungus and rhizo means root, the root of the plant. So as we mentioned, this is a win-win. The plant provides glucose to the fungus and the fungus provides water and minerals to the plant. So mycorrhizal is a great important role that fungi play in an ecosystem. Now another type of relationship are called endophytes and these are special fungus that actually they live inside of plant tissue but they don't cause damage. They actually are helpful to the plant because the fungus releases toxins and these toxins then repel or keep little insects away that would normally come along and feed on and harm the plant. So that's an endophyte, that's another type of relationship. And then the third type that I want us to talk about are called lichens, L-I-C-H-E-N. And this is between a fungus. So the fungus is, the, is one member. And the second member has to be a photosynthetic organism. So it can either be an algae, 
or a cyanobacteria. And remember, if, if, if you recall from our bacteria chapter, a cyanobacteria is, it's, it is a prokaryotic cell. It's a bacterial cell, but it has the ability to photosynthesize. So it's the relationship between one or the other of these photosynthetic organisms with a fungus. And the, the wonderful thing about these is they can survive places that neither one of them could survive alone. Um, one interesting fact is that the U.S. Forest Service actually monitors how much lichen is around, how healthy it is, um, because they are very sensitive to air pollution. So it can be an indicator that there's a problem with air pollution if, if there's a decline in the lichens. So let's take a look at a lichen. So you've probably seen these if you've ever gone hiking or maybe even if you live somewhere where you know, it's, you're not right in the middle of the city, you may have seen these growing. Or maybe in the city. All right, last page of our fungus study guide. I mentioned a few pathogenic fungi. So we've already talked about the Catridiomycota, right? That those are there's many parasitic ones that infect um, amphibians. Uh, in general, though, when when we say a mycosis, that essentially means that it is an infection that's caused by a fungus. And we have some common ones, right? Like athlete's foot, ringworm. Those are caused by pathogenic fungi. Um, this other organism. Aspergillus produces toxins that are both toxic and carcinogenic. These can grow in different crops, um, so specifically nuts and grains. Um, and, and these are more common, I guess, or cause more damage in developing countries, right? In, in developing countries, they eat primarily plant crops, not so much meat. And so these crops can recall of food or food shortages can cause more problems in those countries. Now this this organism here, this fungus, Claviceps purpurea, causes something called ergot. And this is, it could be in wheat or rye or some other kind of grain type crop. What's interesting about it is that it, it produces toxins and the toxins contain a chemical called lysergic acid, which is essentially a precursor to LSG, which is a hallucinogenic drug. Um, and I have read some information um, that there are some historians who think that back in the Salem witch trials, that perhaps some of these women who were getting burned at the stake for being witches, that there may have been some thought that some of the crops had been infected with this fungus and so people were eating these toxins and it was causing hallucinations and other things and making them act in a way that they were accusing them of being witches. I don't know. It's a, it's a theory. Okay, and then histoplasmosis is a fungal infection that uh, infects your lungs. So it's a, a pulmonary infection. And that takes us to the end of the fungus chapter. Now the same week that we had fungus, we covered the first part of plants. So we covered the, the, the seedless plants. So I'm going to go to that now. So this is still week five. All right. So um, just like we talked about fungi, what are some of the key characteristics that you say, okay, that I, I recognize this is a fungus. For plants, the type of cell is, is eukaryotic, right? Everything we're looking at today is made up of eukaryotic cells, so they have nuclei. Plants are autotrophic, meaning they make their own food, and they're specifically photosynthetic. They make their food by using the sun's energy or sunlight. So um, plants can reproduce sexually and asexually, but for the most part, it's sexual reproduction. And whereas fungi had chitin in their cell wall, plants have cellulose. Okay. Are they multi 
or yes, they are. Um, except there are a few green algae that are that are considered plants that are unicellular. Now we focus on basically four groups of plants. Okay, um, so we'll talk about each of those four tonight. Um, so the question that your book asks: Are green algae plants, or are they protists? And so, for the most part, they're considered plants. Um, because they have both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and another um, pigment called carotene, which is what makes your carrots orange, right, or sweet potatoes orange. And whereas the other types of algae that we talked about, we talked about the protist chapter, don't have those particular pigments. Now, plants, we already know, right, do a great job in providing us oxygen, so they convert carbon dioxide. Um, into sugar, glucose, and they produce oxygen for us. They also are the base of most food chains. So the terrestrial food chains, the land dwelling, most of us land dwelling organisms rely on plants. Otherwise, none of us would survive, right? Because they're the base of our food chain. Another key important thing to know about plants is that the way that their life cycle works, we call it an alternation of generations. And that's because they essentially have two different generations. They have a sporophyte generation and they have a gametophyte generation. And I want you to understand some basic things about that. So first of all, the sporophyte generation is diploid. And, and just to review what diploid means, diploid just means that you have two copies of every chromosome in every cell. So we're diploid organisms. You get you got a copy of every chromosome from your mom and a copy from your dad, so you have two copies of everything. Same thing with the sporophyte generation of a plant. There's two copies right, from each parent. Now the gametophyte generation is haploid. Haploid means there's only one copy per cell, one copy of every chromosome. So that means it's got half, right? You cut the genetic material in half in the haploid generation. I'm gonna we're going to look at the alternation of generations a little closer in a minute, but let me just cover the general key components of plants and then we'll do that. So, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about four groups of land plants. Okay, um, All four of those groups have what we call embryo protection, and that's why we call them embryophytes. And what do I mean by embryo protection? What I mean is the embryo, right, is, is nothing more than the baby plant, right? The new baby plant. And so embryo protection means that the plant itself is going to provide some sort of protection or is going to nourish in some way this baby plant. Okay. Now we're going to get to the four groups, but first I just want to spend a little time talking about the alternation of generations life cycle. This first one is very general. Okay. And um, it's color coded, so the top half, everything in the top half is haploid, everything in the bottom half is diploid. Now I want you to notice that the sporophyte generation is the diploid generation, and the gametophyte is all is the haploid generation. Okay. Now let's look through how, how this goes about. Well, let's say that we're starting with the sporophyte. The sporophyte undergoes meiosis. So what is meiosis? Okay. This is a cell division that cuts genetic material in half, right? So we have two copies of all chromosomes in the sporophyte generation. After meiosis, only one. They're haploid now. So the sporophyte generation is producing the spores but the spores are going to be haploid because they go through this process of meiosis that cuts everything in half. Now each spore then undergoes mitosis. So mitosis is a cell division that is not going to change the chromosome number. So in other words, if a cell is haploid, the resulting cell from mitosis will still be haploid. If the cell is diploid, the resulting cells from mitosis will be diploid. So these spores go through mitosis, this just means this cell divides, right, one to two, two to four, and it, it grows in size, doesn't change though, they're still haploid. 
to form the gametophyte generation. Now the gametophyte generation will actually produce the gametes. So what are gametes? This is sperm, right? An egg, okay? These are still haploid. When the sperm and egg fuse, now haploid plus haploid together is going to restore a diploid cell. So we're back to the diploid generation. So this zygote is the first cell of the baby plant or the embryo. Okay, then the zygote will divide by mitosis, so one cell to two, two to four, four to eight, on and on and on, until it develops into the sporophyte. Now, we're going to look at this alternation of generations like life cycle for each of the four, each of the four groups of plants and how it looks a little bit, it's the same general idea, but just so you can see how it looks a little bit different um, for each of the groups of plants. So those of you that just joined in, welcome. Anytime you have a question, raise your hand or type it in the chat box and I'll make sure that I, and well, I'll do my best to answer it for you. How about that? All right. Back to the study guide. Our first group that I want us to talk about are the bryophytes. Okay. You can also call these non-vascular plants. So vascular tissue, right, for us, vascular tissue would be our veins and our arteries. But plants don't have veins and arteries. Instead, they have xylem and phloem. Okay. You also might think of it as um, roots, whoops, stems, and leaves. Okay. So non-vascular means no root stems or leaves. Okay. So some examples of bryophytes, the, the one that you probably recognize and know right now are mosses, okay? There are also plants called liverwort and hornworts that fall into this category. So let's talk about the features of these bryophytes, okay? And I might also call them mosses because that's the most recognizable example, right? So they have embryo protection because we said all plants have that, okay? No true root stems or leaves, we know that. This is an interesting thing. So this is the only group that we're going to talk about in the, which this is the true case. So for a moss or any other bryophyte, the gametophyte is the dominant form or the dominant generation. And what that means is if you were to walk outside and see a moss growing somewhere and you recognize that that's a moss, that's what you're seeing is the gametophyte. You wouldn't recognize the sporophyte generation as a moss. Okay. Now, because they don't have true root stems or leaves, they're limited in size, right? They cannot grow that large. They don't have a way to transport nutrients. Um, the other important thing, and your lab pointed this out, is that their sperm have flagella, their flagellated sperm, their swimming sperm, however you want to call that. Therefore, those flagellated or swimming sperm can't get to the egg if they're not around water. So these guys are dependent not only on, wa on water as far as their cells need water, but for fertilization. They're dependent on living very near water. That's group one. Now, Let's look at the life cycle really quick of a moss. Okay, so this is, oops, something happened here. For some reason, my moss doesn't want to share. Hold on a second. Let me try to upload this really quick. <laughs> 
Okay, yay, here we go. All right, so this is that same alternation of generations life cycle, but this time it's more specific to, to a bryophyte, to a moss. And so what I want you to see is down here at the bottom, this is the gametophyte generation. So, you know, if you went around a lake or a pond or wherever and you saw moss growing, okay, this is what you would recognize as the moss, okay? Now, the other thing is in lab, you looked at an antheridium and you looked at an archegonian. So the archegonian is the female reproductive structure where the egg is found and the antheridium is the, is the male reproductive structure where the sperm is produced. So you see... Um, you've seen what both of those gametes look like for a moss, okay? Now, the zygote, one, um, each haploid cell fused together to form a diploid zygote. Right now, we're in the diploid generation. What I want you to see, this part right here, that is the sporophyte generation. You wouldn't recognize that. You wouldn't see that one little part and say that's a moss, right? It would be this part down here that you would recognize as a moss. So when I say the dominant generation is the gametophyte, that's because that's the, the main one, right, that you recognize, the main um, body of this particular plant. So again, the sporophyte is going to produce spores, okay? The spores are produced through meiosis, meaning these spores now, the, the chromosomes have been cut in half, right? So instead of having two copies, there's only one. Each of these spores then can fall down, right, and germinate, and that can make a new uh, gametophyte plant. So that's the alternation of generation specific to the moss. Okay, our next group um, are still, uh, oops, here we go. They're still seedless, um, and, and we call them seedless vascular plants because now we do have true roots. Can I put the picture up? Sure, of the moss? Yes, I sure can. Sure. And these, uh, I should have said this in the beginning, um, all of these plant figures, all the animal figures, everything should be out of open stacks. The only thing, only pictures that I've added that are not out of open stacks, I did um, take some other pictures of different fun of different fungi just to show you but the rest of the figures that I use should be directly out of your open stacks book okay so our ferns are seedless vascular okay meaning vascular meaning they do have true roots stems and leaves Still no seeds, okay? So all plants that we're talking about have protection. Now we have true vascular tissue. I want to mention something called xylem and phloem, okay? These are important. This is like we have veins and arteries. This is sort of like the veins and arteries for plants. So the xylem is responsible for transporting water and nutrients. It has a special chemical, okay, lignin, in the cell walls. Helps give it some structure. And phloem then transports sugars and other nutrients throughout the plant, okay? Now, as I mentioned, the only group that the gametophyte generation is dominant are the bryophytes, the mosses. So we see that in seedless vascular, the sporophyte is the dominant generation. And if you've ever had a fern or seen a fern and you've turned those big leaves over and looked at the underside, you'll see some little small circular things that are called sori and these sori under on the underside of the leaves are eventually what are going to produce the spores which get released um, into the air now just like the bryophytes 
this group still is reliant on uh, moist or wet surfaces, still relying on water because they have swimming sperm. So the sperm can't get to the egg if it doesn't have some water in order to do that. So let's go back and look at the life cycle of a fern. Okay, so same thing, right? Get gametophyte, sporophyte. We're just looking at the specific case of a fern or a seedless vascular plant. Now, this time, I'm pretty sure this is what you would recognize as the fern, right? Not this down here. So when we say the dominant generation, that, that's what we mean, right? The one that you, you recognize as the main body of the plant. Now, these little things are the sori that I mentioned to you on the underside of the leaves. And so, same way that the from the spore of fat generation, those are going to undergo meiosis, cut the chromosome number in half so that the spores are now haploid, right? They're down here in the haploid generation. Um, though, those will fall on the ground somewhere, germinate, grow into the little gametophyte version. The gametophyte then produces sperm and egg, both male and female. When those two haploid cells join and fuse, they restore the diploid nature, right? So the zygote, remember, is this is just our baby plant, okay? And, and divides by mitosis back to the sporophyte generation. So by the end of tonight, you're going to be really sick of alternation of generations life cycle, but it's important. Okay, now, so this, this was the first study guide, so we're going to move on to gymnosperms and angiosperms in the next study guide. Um, and this is just another mention. I think we mentioned at the beginning, but plants are important, right, in all ecosystems. They, they produce oxygen. They reduce carbon dioxide. They're the base of most food chains, so without plants would be, well, after a while, dead. All right, moving on. So we covered two groups. Now we're on the third group, which are gymnosperms. And these last two groups, gymnosperms and angiosperms, are both what we call seed plants because they make seeds. Okay. Now, the first two groups that we talked about, we're dependent on water, and when I say dependent on water, I'm talking about for their reproduction, right? All plants need water, um, but I'm talking about for the sperm to fertilize the egg. So um, in this case, excuse me, these are not dependent on water for fertilization, okay? So that's a benefit, right, that we can, they are, can tolerate a drier climate because they're not as dependent on water for that need. Terms um, are include conifers, okay, cycads. So conifers would be like cone bearing trees, like a pine tree, right? Where you where you see them develop those those cones. What it essentially means is naked seeds. So they do not have a fruit, right? They do not make a flower. They're exposed seeds either in a cone or in a specially modified leaf. They, they have different male and female gametes. And in this case, it is wind, okay, that is going to pollinate these. So and when we get to angiosperms, we'll talk about how most angiosperms, right, are pollinated by insects or by birds or by bee, uh, bats. But gymnosperm, it's the wind that does the pollination. Um, I think I mentioned this later. Yes, I do, so I'll wait. Okay, so here's the examples we talked about. Okay, again, they have an alternation of generations life cycle. We'll look at that in just a minute. Just as I mentioned to you, everything except the mosses or the bryophytes has the sporophyte generation as the dominant generation. These are heterosporous which means they form two different types of spores. They have a male spore and a female spore. The male spore are called the microspores, and the female are called megaspores. 
they also, maybe you've not looked close to a, a conifer tree, but they actually have two different types of cones. The, the male and female cones look different. They're also on different locations usually in the tree, okay? Usually, let me see, let me write this. The male cones are lower oops, than the female cones. So the wind has to carry um, the male uh, pollen up to the female cones. Um, male cones produce pollen grains by meiosis, so same same type um, alternation of generations life cycle. The pollen grains are the gametophyte generation. So we're talking about a very small right, gametophyte. A pollen grain is the gametophyte. So how does this happen? How's the female cone fertilized? Well, so will blow, land on a female cone, and then a pollen tube will form and begin to grow into this um, female cone. Finally, when it reaches a certain point, the, the sperm that's inside of the pollen grain will fertilize the egg cell. Now, each female cone has two ovules per scale. So if you think about each cone has multiple scales, right? Each ovule has a megaspore, so this is the female version of spores, and it's going to undergo meiosis to produce four cells. Three of those four break down, kind of similar to when a, when a like us, when, when females produce eggs, we don't produce four eggs at a time, we produce one, and the other three get reabsorbed. So the, the last one, the only one that remains, is what becomes the female gamete, or the egg. Now when this is, when the egg is fertilized, that will be the embryo, and it will be enclosed in a hardy seed so we've added in seeds in this group of plants. Now one interesting fact, in pine trees, this whole process can take about two years after pollination occurs. So it's not, it's not a quick process. Now we move on to our last group, the angiosperm. So these are flowering plants, which essentially means covered seeds. So also, right, we know that these produce fruit. These make up the majority of all plant species, so about 90%. And again, what's different about them? Well, they make a flower and they make a fruit. There are a lot of angiosperms that you may not recognize as angiosperms because they don't have a big showy flower, but they are flowering plants. So a lot of our food um, is, besides just fruit, right, even our cereal crops like rice, wheat, and potatoes, those are all angiosperms. And as I mentioned to you, lots of societies almost rely exclusively on seed plants for their nutrition. There's not much meat eaten in, in other parts of the world. So again, alternation of generations life cycle, dominant form is, form is the sporophyte, that's the one you would recognize as the tree or the plant. And we have some reproduction that I want us to look at. Okay, I'm going to show you a figure. Essentially, the female, the overall portion is called the carpal, and that includes three structures, the style, the stigma, and the ovary. As the male portion is called the stamens, and that includes the anther and the filament. So let's take a minute. And look at that. Okay, so let's look up here at the top. So here's the, the flower part, okay? And the, the green part in the middle here, this is the female portion, okay? So the top part where the pollen grain is going to land, that's the stigma. This portion, 
down here below the stigma is called the style. Okay. And then um, down here is where we would find the ovule, right, where the egg would be located okay, that would be fertilized by the sperm. So this whole portion, all the female portion, will be called the carpal. Now one other thing I want to point out to you, the ovary, okay, so the ovule is where the egg is going to be found. That's where the embryo is going to form. The the ovary is what's going to become the fleshy fruit. Okay. Now the male component, so let's look here, this, so it's blown up right here. The filament is essentially this little stem, right, that's holding up the anther. And the anther is what's going to contain the pollen grains. So in this life cycle, um, you see that essentially, well, let's start right here. Okay, we have the baby plant or the embryo. We have something called the endosperm, which is formed um, by something called double fertilization, which is unique to angiosperms. We'll talk about that in just a second. And then you have the seed coat around it. Okay, so, the, you know, if you've ever had a garden, you plant the seed, you have a little sprout that comes up, and eventually, right, you get the full plant. Now, I do want to point out to you um, something called double fertilization. You don't need to know all the details of how this works, but I want you to know that when the egg fuses with the sperm, there is another sperm that fuses with two other cells in the female reproductive structure, and this is what forms the endosperm. Now, the, what, what's important about the endosperm, essentially, this is like a, a food source or a food reserve for the embryo or the baby plant. Now, far, as far as cereal crops go or, or th grains that we eat, it's the endosperm, right, that, that we're making the flour out of. That's what's providing us our calories and our nutrients is the endosperm part of the seed. All right, so let's go back here. Okay, so just like the um, gymnosperms, angiosperm also heterosperms. They have a female version and a male version. Okay, um, this blank. So the pollen grain is the male gametophyte. The female gametophyte has that one egg cell that's going to be fertilized by the sperm, but it also has these other two nuclei. That's what's going to, um, there's going to be another sperm that fertilizes these or that fuses with these to form the endosperm. Now grasses are angiosperms even though we might not think about it because they don't have a large showy flower, but they do flower. And grasses, because they don't have such a large showy flower, they're pollinated by wind. But 80% of all angiosperms are going to be pollinated by some kind of animal, so whether it be an insect or a bee or a bat. And what does pollination actually mean? Well, all that means is it's taking the pollen, remember, from the anther, those pollen grains, and moving the pollen onto the stigma or the female portion of the flower. So this talks a little more about the double fertilization. So remember, we there's a pollen tube that, that sort of divides down all the way down the style to the ovary. And there's two sperm. One of those sperms is going to fuse with the egg. That forms the zygote, the new baby plant. The other sperm fuses that other double nuclei that's part of the female reproductive structure. This forms the endosperm. And as I mentioned, the endosperm is going to feed the baby plant. Okay, It's also what we eat when we eat seeds. <clears throat> 
All right, let's talk about fruit development. What exactly is the fruit? Okay, so as the seed develops, remember it's the ovary that becomes the fruit, so it thickens and forms the fruit. Therefore, the seed is enclosed inside the fruit. So all the fruit is is when the ovary becomes ripe. So all of these things, right, are examples. Bell peppers, nuts, vegetables, green beans, zucchini, berries, peaches, apples, tomatoes, rice, wheat, all of these count for fruits. Oh, and I what I have here, what I want you to have here is the ovule. Whoops, whoops, the ovule becomes the seed and the ovary becomes the fruit. Okay. So, no questions so far? Everybody's good? All right, we'll finish this part up about plants then. Um, on flowering plants, they, you can either have male and, male and female reproductive structures or male and female flowers on the same plant, or you can have a plant that only produces either the male flowers or they produce the female flowers. Um, so, if the plant is called monoecious, it is when they are produced on the same plant. If it's on separate plants, it's called dioecious. So this is D-I-E. I'm going to try to write this so you can read it, but just in case. Dioecious. O-I-O-U. C-I-O-U-S. Okay. Most flowers are monoecious meaning that they have both a male and the female on the same uh, plant. And if that's the case, they're called perfect flowers because they have both male and female components. Now, cross-pollination meaning pollen from one plant, right, um, fertilizing the next, obviously is going to give greater diversity in plants than one plant self-pollinating over and over again where you don't get any uh, diversity in the genetics. So that cross-pollination is a good thing. So we thank bees and other animals for carrying that out. Um, also, when we look at angiosperms, basically we can put them into two groups, the monocots and the dicots. And, and cot is short for cotyledon, which basically means embryonic leaves or the first leaves. Okay, a monocot means when the baby plant begins to, to sprout, there's a single embryonic leaf that comes up. On these, the veins also run parallel on the leaves. So if you think about a lily, when you look at the leaves of a lily, that's what we're, that's what I mean that they're running parallel along the leaves. The flowering parts also come in usually in groups of three or sixes. So grasses would be another example of monocot. Now a dicot has two embryonic leaves when it first comes up. And the the veins on these, so if you a leaf, okay, that's a pretty bad leaf, but the, these veins would be branching, okay, like this, out from the leaf. So Lots of plants, lots of different trees, right, are going to have these um, beans, peaches, uh, many, many roses. Many plants are going to have this type of leaf. Now, asexual reproduction in plants, okay, obviously you have no influence by any other genetics, so it's genetically identical. Um, these do well as long as the conditions aren't changing because there's not going to be much genetic diversity there to adapt, right, to changing conditions. They can actually reach maturity faster. Clearly, as we mentioned, there's not going to be much genetic variation. So naturally, how does this happen? Well, sometimes if you've ever had a flower bed or a garden, you'll see that runners come up, right, and produce buds for a new plant. That would be one way. 
Now, artificially, uh, this happens all the time by grafting. So if you take um, a graft of a plant and grow it instead of normal fertilization, that's one way that you can propagate them asexually. Okay, now let's see, we covered fungi and plants, so we're moving on to invertebrates. Okay, here we go. Now, when we're the invertebrates, one thing I want to make sure I point out is when we think of animals, we might think of like a bear or a dog or a cat, but really 90% of all animals are invertebrates. What does an invertebrate mean? Well, it just means the animal doesn't have a spinal column, it doesn't have a backbone. Okay? But what things can we say are similar or that all animals have in common? Well, first of all, there are no unicellular animals, right? They're all multicellular. And most of them have tissues. They at least, even the simplest ones, are going to have specialized cells. Most of them are modal, at least at some point of their life. They're heterotrophic, so we can't make our own food. And we do not have cell walls. Now I want to talk a little bit about body symmetry. There's basically three types of body plans. The first is no symmetry, meaning there's no way that there's any um, symmetry in that animal's body type. Then there's radial symmetry. So radial symmetry is like, you know, when you have a, a round cake. Um, yeah, so I just covered sperms and angiosperms. That was, that was the one we just finished. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Um, or there may be an outline, maybe, that you're looking at. I may have left the outline in there. Um, so radial symmetry, if you imagine like you have a pizza or a round cake, and so from the center you can essentially right, slice it lots of different ways, and, and each, each slice or piece is exactly the same. Okay, that would be radially symmetrical. Bilateral is like us, where you essentially have a mirror image. Okay, you're looking at a left side and a right side. And so that's important for us to understand as we go through the different phyla of animals. Okay, embryonic development. I want us to, to have an idea of what this is. So the zygote is the first cell, right? This is when the egg and the sperm have fused. So the first new cell of the organism is the zygote. Now what happens initially right after that is something called cleavage. And what I want you to know about cleavage is this is rapid cell division. Okay, that's, that's supposed to say rapid cell division without growth okay so one cell divides into two two to four four to eight but the overall size hasn't changed the next main stage I want you to know is the blastula okay the blastula is essentially a hollow or fluid filled however you want to think of it okay ball of cells And then the next stage in development to know is called the gastrula. And so this sometimes we refer to as what's occurring is gastrulation. And this is when you have the presence of three germ layers. And these are the three germ layers, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. The other important thing about gastrulation is something called the primitive gut forms meaning the very beginning of some kind of digestive canal. Um, I'll sh I'm going to show you an image of that in just a second. 
Let's talk for a second, though, about these three germ layers because I want you to know that once they have differentiated into one of these types, they are destined to become a specific type of tissue. So, for example, um, in, in humans, right, endoderm is going to either become part of the respiratory system or our digestive system. Okay, so internal organs. The mesoderm, we're talking about muscles, your, your muscular system, and, whoops, circulatory. The ectoderm, skin, and nervous system. All right, another feature, and then we're going to look at some pictures. Let's talk about the body cavity or, or lack of. So a coelom means that there is a body cavity that is lined with this mesoderm tissue. Okay, so there is an area inside the organism, if it has a true coelom, that's lined with mesoderm and it has a fluid-filled area. So I want us to recognize the phyla that have this true coelom. I'm going to do my best to write in this small space. I didn't leave myself enough room. Okay. The annelids or annelida, the mollusks or mollusca, the arthropods or arthropoda, and the chordates or chordata. Now, a pseudocelum means that it does have a body cavity, but it's only partly lined with the mesoderm tissue. And the phylum that has this type of body cavity are the roundworms or the nematodes. We're going to do one more, and then we're going to look at some... Okay, no coelom, meaning there is no fluid-filled body cavity. It is solid tissue, okay? This phylum is flatworms. Now, I'm going to, we're going to look at some images together. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so this is this is directly out of your free textbook, and what I want you to focus on is the type of body cavity. So what you see there, um, a coelomate meaning no true coelom. That's the flatworms. Okay, and what you see is there there is no body cavity or fluid filled area, right? It's all tissue. There's there's um, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and then the digestive cavity. There's no fluid filled area. Okay, it's all solid tissue. Now the eucelomate, that means a true coelom, okay? And so you have your ectoderm, you have mesoderm. Then you have a fluid-filled area opening the coelom with more mesoderm before your ectoderm. So the light pink area represents the body cavity that's filled with fluid or the true coelom. And on the pseudocoelomate, the roundworms, you see that there is a fluid-filled cavity, but it's only lined on one side of that cavity with mesoderm, right? The other side is not lined with mesoderm. Now the next area in our review that we're going to talk about is, is this picture right here. So we're going to talk about it here and then we'll go back to the review.
Um, those with a true, those with, with bilateral symmetry, okay, um, that, that are U-coelomates, in other words, they have a true coelom, they can be divided basically into two groups, the, the deuterostomes and the protostomes. And it all has to do with what, what happens to the very first opening during gastrulation. So in gastrulation, what you see is you start to have this, this opening or this invagination in one part of the developing organism. Well, if that first opening becomes the anus, it's a deuterostome, meaning mouth second. If the first opening becomes a mouth, it's a protostome, meaning mouth first. So keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that as we go through our animal kingdoms tonight. So we'll pick back up here. So I mentioned to you protostomes and, de and deuterostomes were, were coming up next. So the protostomes, the first opening, in, in the, in, we're talking about during gastrulation, when that gastric cavity forms, the first opening is the mouth. So let's make sure we know which phyla are protostomes, okay? And these are going to be the arthropods, or arthropoda, the mollusks, or mollusca, and the annelids. Okay, deuterostomes is where the first opening is the anus, or in other words, the, the mouth is the second opening, and the phyla are chordates, so that's us, right? All vertebrates, and something called echinoderms, which are like sea urchins, sea stars, starfish. That would be those guys. All right, moving on. We are, we are going to discuss nine different phyla, and I have some key information that I want you to know about each one. So the first one is periphera that you can just think of as the sponges. Okay, these are the absolute simplest animal. Okay, they have, they are the only one that has no symmetry. The adults are not modal, but they do have larva. They go through a larva stage, and their larva are swimming, so they have motility. This is the one that has no true tissues, but they do have specialized cells. Okay, I'm going to have to write this over here. I didn't leave myself enough room. Okay, these special cells called coanocytes have flagellated cells, and essentially what they're doing is they're moving they, their flagella. These are, these are water-dwelling organisms, right, that live in the ocean. They're moving their flagella to sort of cause the water to move in through the pores of the sponge. These, these type of cells also will differentiate to become the sperm, the reproductive cell of the organism. The other type of cell that they have is called an amoebocyte, and these are important in transferring nutrients for the organism, and these will also differentiate into the female reproductive structure or the egg. Now, these are very simple. So they, they just use diffusion to get nutrients right out of the water. And they also use diffusion for their gas exchange. So essentially the water is coming in through the pores because these coanocytes are moving the flagella. It, it causes the water to flow in and it flows out through the top of this sponge. And the top has a special name. It's called an osculum. The reproduction of these can either be asexual, they can bud, or it can be sexual, okay? The sperm are released, but fertilization occurs internally where the sperm fertilizes the egg. So that's our first phylum. 
We're going to look at a couple phyla at a time, and then we'll look at some pictures. So the second one, if, if we sort of think of moving up in, in complexity, okay, in the daria, so that C is silent. So these have radial symmetry, and they have two germ layers. They don't have all three. They have two. They have two possible plants and some of these organisms have one body type and some have another and some actually shift back and forth between the two body types. So the Medusa, M-E-D-U-S-S-A, is one body type. So an organism that has this body type is, is like a jellyfish. The other body plant is called a polyp and an example of that would be the C anemone. Nemone. There we go. Okay, these have extracellular digestion in a cavity. There's only one opening, meaning what comes in goes, the waste goes out the same opening. Again, they use diffusion um, for gas exchange. These do, however, have a simple nerve net. Same thing we can have either a sexual or sexual reproduction. Now one really important neat thing about these, maybe not so neat if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, but they have special called nidocytes and these are the stinging cells. And what's inside of them is a little structure called a nemocyst, which essentially like has a coiled thread. And when it's triggered, it shoots that out. And that's what causes, if you've ever had a jellyfish sting, that's what is, is sending you that pain. Now let's look at some examples of both periphera and nadaria. Okay, so these guys here, this, this is a simple sponge, the simplest organism. And so um, water is going to come in through the pores and out through the top or the osculum. Okay, there's a diagram of what that looks like. Um, the nadarian, so this is showing you um, what the nidocyte, especially the skinny cell, and here are the two body plants of so the medusa. So this would be like the jellyfish, right? And the polyp would be what like a sea anemone looks like. So here's a, a sea anemone, the polyp version. And there's a jelly, which would be the medusa body plant. Okay, moving on. Next phylum is Platyhelminthes, which includes flatworms, tapeworms, and planarians. So some of these, many of these are parasitic, but they're not all parasitic. They can also be free living. What's important um, in this phylum so far, this is our first organism we've seen tonight that actually has bilateral symmetry. So maybe you think of a worm as being radial symmetrical, but it's not. They actually have mirror images, so they have bilateral symmetry. They also have the full three germ layers, but remember this is the one phylum that has no coelom. It's just all um, solid tissue. Still have gas exchange by direct diffusion. But we do have internal fertilization of these. Many of these are hermaphroditic, meaning they have both reproductive organs for both sexes. They have nerve cords, including what's called a photosensory spot that, that can detect light. The tapeworms have um, what's called a sucker, okay? Or also I have the S there, a scolex for attachment. Okay, so that's the little specialized mouth part that attaches and feeds off of the, the host. Um, and then 
the other thing I want you to know is P R O G L O T T I D S. Proglottids are these segments of tapeworms that essentially break off into pieces in the feces of those animals that are infected with these tapeworms. So if, maybe if you've ever had animals that have been infected, you've seen these in their feces that can be passed on that way. All right, next phyla, phylum is the mollusca or the mollusks. So these have a true coelom. They also have bilateral symmetry. They have a segmented, soft segmented body. What's important uh, to recognize for these that's different than others is they have what's called a muscular foot which moves against the fluid of this true coelom. Many of them have what's called a mantle, and the mantle secretes a hard shell made of calcium carbonate. So if you think about a snail, okay, a snail is a mollusk, and a snail produces this shell, right, made of calcium carbonate. They also have a special tongue-like structure called a radula, and it's made of chitin, which we've heard about already tonight. We, ha we know that fungus have cell walls made of chitin. Okay. Within the mollusk, there's four general groups that I want you to know. Okay. The chitins is, is one group. Okay. And the, I'm going to show you these in a minute. These essentially have their groups of eight overlapping shells, and these are typically marine organisms. We'll sh I'll show you these in a minute. And then the next group are the bivalves. So oysters, clams that have the, the, the double shell. Okay. Gastropods. Okay. These, for example, will be snails, slugs, And what gastropod means is stomach footed. So if you think about it, it, it is as though they're moving, right, on their stomach. Cephalopods means head footed. So octopus and squid, because if you think about it, it's everything is directly connected to their head. So that's where they get their name. So let's now have a look at both of these groups. Whoops. Okay, so here is an example of a flatworm. This one happens to be a planarian. So you can see that it does not have radial symmetry. Instead, you, you have to look at it as you have a left and right mirror image there. So you can see the eye spot or the photosensory spot. And remember, these don't have a coelom. They they're, they're, they're have tissue throughout. Okay. There's just there's a there's an example of a tapeworm there. Lots of parasitic flatworms. Okay, we're gonna skip that one for a minute. Where are my mollusks? Here we go. All right. Mollusks. So that one would be the ga a gastropod, right? A snail. You see the mantle there that's gonna secrete and make that hard calcium carbonate covering. This right here is a chitin, so you see that has eight overlapping plates or shells. Okay, snail and slug. So I mentioned many of them secrete the shell. Obviously, the slug right doesn't have the shell. So those are the stomach-footed ones, the gastropods, and these are the head-footed or the cephalopods. So the cuttlefish, um, the squid, the octopus, and the nautilus all fall into this category.
Okay, moving along, we have next the annelids or annelida. Okay, these would the best example that you might want to think about is the earthworm. It also includes leeches. These also have bilateral symmetry. They have a true coelom, still gas exchange by diffusion. Okay, these guys have a simple brain. They're hermaphroditic or have both sexes for many of them. Okay, these are segmented worms. When you look at them, you can see that they're broken up into different segments. And this structure right here, the clitellum, is a type of their reproductive structure. So if you've looked at an earthworm, and I'll show you in a minute, it's sort of a little area that looks different than all the rest of the segments. And what it does, it produces mucus for the sperm and it also provides a little cocoon for fertilization so it sort of it it helps the sperm to to make contact with the sperm where the sperm um, is received where it can go and fertilize the egg and then once that happens it sort of serves as a cocoon for the fertilization to occur so we'll look at that in just a minute but let's let's finish up this page so the the next category the nematodes Roundworms and hookworms. These are kind of have some nasty parasitic examples. They have bilateral symmetry. They have the pseudo coelom, not a true coelom. So some are free living, some are parasitic. Um, these guys have a cuticle that does not grow with them, so it requires that they molt, kind of like arthropods. Now, we mentioned that invertebrates made up, you know, about 97% of all animals. Well, arthropods make up about 85% of that. So this is the, the largest group of animals. These also have bilateral symmetry. One other important thing, these have an exoskeleton. So it also requires them as they grow, they have to shed that and, and grow a new one right they they can't it doesn't grow with them they go through a larva stage what do I mean by sexual dimorphism well the female and the male look differently so all of the groups included in arthropods would be all the insects arachnids right which are like spiders ticks anything with eight legs millipedes, the centipedes, the crustaceans, so this would be like crabs, lobster, all of those would fall into this category, and the scorpions. So all of those would be arthropods. Okay, they have something called spiracles, where, where the gases can go through this tubular system, how that they um, have gas exchange occurring, and they have a circulatory system that includes a heart. Um, let's see, so we're about to move to our last category. Let me see. or our last lesson, excuse me. Here we go, animals. All right, so this is the last study guide. This is actually what your lesson is for this week. So this is our second lesson on animals. And um, for the most part, this lesson is on chordates, but there's one group that I wanna talk about a little bit before we move on to the chordate. So we already touched on a little bit about deuterostomes and protostomes, but just to review, deuterostome means that the first opening is not the mouth, it's the anus, and that includes a group called echinoderms and the chordates, right, which includes us. So we are a deuterostome. <laughs> 
protostomes is when the first opening is the mouth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about echinoderms before we move on to the chordates. These are really interesting. They have, most of them have five part radial symmetry. So if you think about a C star, okay. I'm sorry about that. That's beautiful artwork. But a C star has five arms, okay. And so they have this radial symmetry that's five part meaning, right, that all five of those out from the middle, um, you could slice it all, they're equivalent five parts out from the middle. But they, they have a larva stage, and the larva actually has bilateral symmetry. Now they have um, spiny skin, so they have, they also, have this hard calcium carbonate like we mentioned with the mollusks that makes sort of this shell-like hard structure but it's covered by words there's an outer covering over this hard calcium carbonate they they have tube feet that if you've ever seen one in an aquarium or like a um, sea urchin Okay, so let's put here sea star would be an example, or starfish. Sea urchin would be another example. If you've ever seen these, they have tube feet, which they can use uh, as like a suction cup, right, to grab onto their food source, or you'll, they'll attach to the glass walls of the aquarium with these, with these tube feet. They have external fertilization. So what happens is the female releases her eggs right into the water and the male releases his sperm and so the fertilization occurs in the water. Now we will begin with the chordates. What do I want you to know? Well there's four characteristics and and you had a lab on this where you had to tell me what these four characteristics were. So the first is now at some stage of their development they have to have all these right. They don't many of them don't have them in their, their adult form. So at some point they have to have a notochord. Now for us, for vertebrates, that gets replaced by the vertebral column, right? Um, the next characteristic is a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Okay, and again, this for us develops into our brain and our spinal cord. Okay, three, pharyngeal, that's our pharyng, there's an N, sorry, I'm having a little trouble there. Pharyngeal slits, okay, these can differentiate, for example, in fish into gills. For us or other animals, they can differentiate into tonsils or part of the inner ear. Okay, but at some stage in development, all animal, all chordates have these. And then a tail, a post-anal tail. Okay, we don't have a tail, right? All we have left at birth is the, the tailbone. But I didn't mention, but many animals right their tail is very useful so for locomotion balance sometimes even for signaling part of their mating or courting rituals okay so the tail is an important component in animals now not all chordates are vertebrates there are a couple of invertebrate meaning no vertebral column and so i just want to mention them the tunicates and the lancelets are two examples of invertebrate chordates. But I want us to spend our time talking about the different groups of vertebrates. So first one, first group is the fish. So what do fish have? Well, they have gills and they have fins. There are cartilaginous fish, which means rather than having bone, their skeleton is made of cartilage. And so this would be um, sharks. rays and skates and some important components that we want to know about these fish okay they have what's called a lateral line 
which helps them to detect vibration so that they can either find prey or get away from predators. They also have something called an ampullae of Lorenzini, which is a specialized sense organ. And it detects electric fields, which also helps them to seek out their prey. They have in their heart two different chambers or two separate portions of the heart, right, where blood can flow. Now, for, for the cartilaginous fish, mostly it is internal fertilization. And there's basically three ways that we have um, development of the young. The first is ovoviviparous, and this means that there are eggs, okay? They are retained in the mother's body, okay? They hatch in the uterus, and then they're born live. Then there's oviparous. In this one, there are eggs, and the eggs hatch outside of mom's body. And then we have viviparous. Okay, so this is where the young develop inside the mother's body, okay, and the mom gives birth to the live animal, the live cartilaginous fish. All right, then we move on to bony fish, so we have bones instead of cartilage. They have a swim bladder. What's the point of that? It has nothing to do with their urinary system. It has to do with their buoyancy in the water. They also have the lateral line that helps them to detect vibration. They undergo external fertilization. They can pump water over their gills so they don't have to have constant swimming. There's two groups. There are ray finned fish and then on the next page the lobe finned fish. Almost every fish that you can imagine right now, catfish, tuna, salmon, trout, are going to fall in this ray fish, excuse me, ray finned fish category. The lobe finned fish, this is, it actually has, their fins have a, a central bone and more, much more muscle than the ray finned fish. And the example of this are called lungfish. And what's interesting about them is they do, in fact, have lungs. So if they are in a, a dried up creek bed or somewhere where the, the water dries up, they can actually gulp air. Okay. Now I just, I do in a minute want to show you a lobe finned fish. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so in this figure, this is out of OpenStax, on the left is a salmon, okay, and on the right is a lobe fin fish. So if you look at the, at the fins, they're just much thicker and more muscular than the ray fin fish. All right, next group are the amphibians. Think of them as having a double life. There's, there's two ways in which they have a double life. The first is they do go through metamorphosis right, from tadpole to frog or similar, depending on the amphibian. Okay, they also, you know, they go from water to land, 
okay or they have gills and then lungs so they have a double life there these have a three chambered heart so fish only had the two chambered heart whereas amphibians have a three chambered heart they lay eggs but their their eggs don't have any kind of protective shell so they lack the protective shell okay the majority of them oops, have external fertilization as I mentioned the larvae have gills but the adults have lungs however in the adults the lungs alone are not enough for gas exchange so they also exchange gas across their skin so of course amphibians this would be frogs salamanders newts and toads now I want to talk about three groups that are, are what we call amniotes or have an amniotic egg and what does that mean well that means these eggs do have a protective shell and the embryo is actually protected by some additional features one including amniotic fluid okay there are three groups reptiles birds and believe it or not mammals are mammals that lay eggs we'll talk about that at the end all right reptiles okay have oops that that's supposed to say internal fertilization they have a three chambered heart except for crocodilians crocodilians actually have a four chambered heart okay and then we're going to move on to birds so what should you know about birds well birds have to have certain different characteristics because of flight they have to be light so one of those is their bones are hollow okay they have feathers and their feathers are all oops excuse me obviously important in flight but also they provide insulation for the bird and they can be very colorful so we were at a school over the weekend um, in Addison my boys had to go there for a band thing and this school they have peacocks on their school grounds so these male peacocks are just strutting around these beautiful feathers so obviously that is part of that is in attracting a mate okay they are one of the groups that have amniotic eggs the other thing that helps them to get plenty of oxygen is their airflow is unidirectional or one way so they constantly have they're constantly oxygenated they're endothermic what does endothermic mean okay we might call warm-blooded they're able to produce heat right to keep themselves warm birds have internal fertilization and we move to our last category which is mammals so what do mammals have well they have hair they have milk um, what's the purpose of hair well one of them is for insulation so helping insulation but also hair can serve sensory functions so for example whiskers right it might they might detect things with sensories for us just think about your eyelashes if something comes close to your eye right there's gonna be a reflex that you close your eyelid because you're protecting your eye so it provides sensory help also okay social coloration okay so think about like um, a lion's mane or something like that okay we make milk to feed our young we have big brains so we can think our way right out of some situations we have a diaphragm pardon me that helps us to draw air in our lungs um, and you know what I don't have this on here but we have four chambers to our heart there are three types of mammals 
Okay, this term eutherian you might think of as a placental mammal. These are like us. We have a placenta where our, where our young um, develop. What's the whole point of a placenta? Well, this is the site where gas exchange occurs as well as nutrients and waste, right, are passed between baby and mom. Another group would be the marsupials. These are, these are mammals that have a pouch. So the young are born very underdeveloped, right? And they have to crawl in the pouch where they can receive milk there and develop further until they're able to live on their own. And the last group, which is the smallest group, these would be the monotremes. And these are actually egg-laying mammals. And there's two groups, so the platform is one and the echidna which is like a, a spiny anteater is maybe you would know it as okay these are interesting organisms that completes I believe um, our review so I'm going to open it up for questions now